Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to my podcast with Mr. Darren Williams. We left off uh, the other day. We had a lot to get through, so we've come back. So we could not. We don't want to rush it. We just want to meander gently through the fascinating content that Darren has for us. You've got the notes, mate. I don't even know where we're going. Next. Where are we going next? We are going to the number one trending topic of our year, yeah. which is the Eastern European country, formerly or maybe in the near future, known as Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So what we will do before that, we will go through a very short recap, because as you stated, yeah. we do talk a lot. Yes. So this is for people who may via a late night YouTube marathon. Yeah, on a come, binge. Yeah, come and discover <laughs> us because they put certain combination of words into the search. So what we'll do is on this PDF you'll see on your screen right now, we will just go through a quick uh, recap of what I've talked about. So the first is three films that we talked about in our first conversation, that being Metropolis, Syriana and Baraku. So for those people, um, you do have a pause button, believe it or not. <laughs> so you can pause on this and write it down. And um, when, if, when you feel free, you can watch them and then go back in time like Doctor Who and watch the first conversation me and Richard had. So they are the three films that we talked about in part one. And now if you go scroll down to the next, this is the first of three television series I recommend that you watch that give you internal thoughts about morality, uh, happiness, sadness, all of the things we experienced, the first being Boardwalk Empire, the second being Utopia, and the third being Atlanta. So if you want to get into a new type of television series that maybe isn't Game of Thrones and you want to impress your friends, choose either Boardwalk Empire, Utopia or Atlanta. And now to the next page, please. Now, I um, mentioned this individual, but I didn't mention, I didn't know his name at the time, because even as brilliant as I am, brilliant. I can't remember everything. <laughs> so Richard, could you, as you notice, we are wearing glasses because we're in serious mode today. Serious mode. So could you please read the two quotes at the top of that page, please, if it can be yeah. uh, just blown up. Thank you. Yeah. The good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. That was by Sir William Osler, the founder of modern medicine. Second quote, I know this defies the law of gravity, but I never studied law, Bugs Bunny. So the reason for them two quotes, that they sum up this individual, Professor Matthew Liao, who is a, how can I describe it? A philosopher... He calls himself a bioethicist. Yes, yeah, so he's sort of like a philosopher stroke, a medical academic expert. Eugenicist, genetics tamperer, <laughs> new world order shell. <laughs> they are the views of Richard Grant and nothing to do with me because I don't want to end up like Amber Heard. So um, the professor, this is a screen grab from a from a free, less than four minute conversation a couple of years ago on Australian television, breakfast television, in which he wanted to inform the people of that country, maybe because they Aussies, yes you, are first in line for Dr. Liao's treatment. And what Dr. Liao claims in terms of saving the planet is he has come with a technique that is medically available now and possible that could unify the height of everybody. And by unifying the physical dimensions of everybody, he claims we would use less clothing material and we would also use less, eat less food. And that he believes is a price worth paying for, to save the planet. Yeah. And he also states that if everybody was say five foot, six to five foot eight, yeah. then the human brain would still develop. It would have no impact on intellect or intellectual uh, capacity. 
So he is currently the director for the Centre of Bioethics and the professor in Department of Philosophy in New York University, NYU. He has previously had posts in Princeton and Oxford University. So what we will do is we internet land we will watch the very short three minute 38 second interview with the professor from what that screen grab is on but unfortunately because of the way our friends in santa clara our overlords are uh, they might strike this wonderful conversation down if i have a problem i can just chop it out. all right cool. That, I, all right, I, I think that'll be all right all right cool but it's just but it's just so matter of fact. Hello, good morning, Australia. Hey, we have someone for you. You are our slaves. Right. Professor Matthew Liao, good morning to you. Good morning. You've yeah. suggested that one thing we might be able to do to reduce the uh, the human footprint on planet Earth is genetically engineer babies to be smaller, thus making them more energy efficient. Explain how that might work. Well, so there are a couple of things that you can do uh, right now already. So there's this technique called uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And what you do there is you can, um, it's, a, it's a technique that's used for um, uh, in, in ver, uh, sort of uh, for fertility clinics. Right, so in IVF treatments and IVF things? IVF treatments, and you can get rid of, uh, you can sort of uh, detect sort of genetic diseases. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that maybe you can use a technique like that to select smaller children. Okay, so yeah. a range yeah. of potential options there. You select the genetic material that is bound to lead to smaller children. That's right, that's right. right. But it requires an in vitro fertilization. Th that's right, so that would require in vitro uh, fertilization. Another possibility is you can use hormone tr treatments. So these are, uh, we already give hormone treatments to children who are expected to be very, very tall, excessively tall. Oh, okay. Um, and so you can give them... You give them hormone treatment in utero now, do we? No, you give them when they're small. Oh, when they're when small, they're, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. and we, so it closes the gl growth plates. With the idea that, <clears throat> excuse me, with, that smaller people would be um, more... Or have a smaller carbon footprint. Will they consume less? That, that's Ooh. right. So other things being equal, larger people consume more energy than smaller people. They also, for example, it takes um, more energy to transport uh, larger people. Uh, they, you need more clothes, uh, mm -hmm. fabric for to clothe mm -hmm. larger people rather than s smaller people. Mm. Uh, they wear out shoes, carpets, etc., etc., uh, yeah, right. more than smaller people. So think of the um, the lifetime carbon footprints. That's quite a lot. So um, and people will think this yeah. is extremely radical. But you know, you think back to a, you know a hundred years ago. From, from what we know of, of people then, they were, I mean, humanity was significantly smaller that, even only a hundred years ago, wasn't that, it? That's right. That's right. So we might have this stat status quo bias where we think that today we have this optimal height and you know we shouldn't do anything to um, mess up, you know mess with our height but uh, height is much more the trait of height is much more fluid to engineer a pill or a drug that would make humans intolerant to meat that that vegetarian a vegetarian population would would be more effective. That's right. Well, so it turns out that livestock farming accounts for 18% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, by really? some estimates, it's almost close to 51%. And a lot of the livestock is for consumption of meat, red meat. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. at even at 18%, that's kind yeah. of like the equivalent of, of car emissions, oh, it's, isn't it? It's, as more, far as it's, the... more, it's higher. It's higher than transport. It's yeah, higher right. than cars. And so that's quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that if you can even reduce consumption by, say, 20%, that could be, a, we can almost achieve zero foot, uh, mm. food miles. Mm. Um, and so the, um, so the suggestion here is that, well, we're already naturally intolerant to various things. So I'm intolerant to milk, for example. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some people are intolerant to crayfish. And I don't drink milk, and it doesn't really bother me. Um, and so the idea is that if we, can, if we t take com uh, common bovine proteins, and we get ourselves to somehow be allergic, to, you mm -hmm. know, react to these um, um, proteins in certain ways, then we can create some sort of meat patch where we wear it, um, you know, when we go out <laughs> uh, to dinner. Uh, um, <laughs> then uh, this could uh, help people who uh, want to give up, uh, you know, eating meat. Eating meat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what the fuck was that <laughs> so hang on first of all so there's a short chinese guy who wants us all to be the same height <laughs> i just had to get that out there and to my chinese followers 
I just want to say 識講廣東話啦，啊冇大冇細啦，冇大冇細 ，which means not big, not small. Which is when someone's being disrespectful and you say you don't have any respect, you say 冇大冇細 ，which means not big, not small. You don't know your place. 冇大冇細啦。<laughs> Who the fuck does he think he is? Well, this is it. So one of the things that in the document that if you just scroll a little bit down, um, I put and the last bit in bold. If you could, yeah, that's brilliant. So my intention isn't to depict Professor Liao as an evil genius, more to bring forward his viewpoint to a wider audience with the aim of intellectual debate and thinking, as the world currently has way too much hostility. So, what my view of it is, if the professor or anybody wishing to do this. Um, via Twitter, he's on Twitter. Wishes to send him this conversation.、Mm. I'm all for it because、mm. hopefully, if he wants to visit Liverpool and explain more of his background, that's, that's, there's no way that that doesn't sound threatening. No, no, <laughs> lads. At any time, <laughs> you'd be totally safe to visit Liverpool and just、uh, we'll just sit down and we'll have a chat. Yeah. <laughs> See, so what it is is that I want to know. About his background, about his upbringing, about his childhood, about what his time in compulsory education was like, because to have that level of casual, relaxed approach、yeah. to making the entire human race a uniform size、yeah. is both, to me personally, new. Yeah, but also maybe a bit worrying. And then、yeah. from a weird sci-fi time travel angle, I've heard, read, and watched X Files and other things that the little grey aliens that are depicted、mm. are actually future humans, right? And they realise that they've gone too far、yeah. in the tampering of the genome. Right. So via time travel, they've come back to now the twentieth century and now、yeah. to sort of get people's reproductive organs and then try to modify it. So could he be the real life Dyson that is seen in the Terminator films? Yeah. Where he starts the process of the downfall. Yeah. And does his little idea end up in grey aliens? That's interesting. So he would be.、Uh... Yeah, he would be the the progenitor of an entire new generation. He'd be he'd be the god of the new generation, the the Abraham of a whole new generation. Exactly. And you'd have to go back in time because in the future, we've gotten greyer and greyer and shorter and short. We're just little grey things with sagging teats and huge eyes. A massive telepathic brain. Massive telepathic But, brains. Like, we, yeah. We can't enjoy cake. Yeah. Because the taste buds in our tongue have been eliminated. Because to enjoy food is bad. Yeah. So、enjoy、now pleasure is bad. And then somebody's gone on the future YouTube in about like six hundred years. Yeah. And they've gone, what is Victoria sponge cake? <laughs> and then they've then said, we've got to go back, lad. We've come back. What for?、It's、rescue cake. <laughs> We don't like cake in our future, and that's fucked up. <laughs> and and then they found Great British Bake Off. Yeah. And the little clever brains have just gone into overload. Why do these people care about different flavors of cake? What is this flavor? <laughs> and then when they see the guy out the mighty boost, just like <laughs> doing this thing, they're like, "We're going back. We're going back." So they're going to fields in Arkansas. And getting people in the Alapasha Mountains and just taking the tongues out. Oh, that's why they're getting the cows that, to find out why they're lactose intolerant, like their god Matthew Liao is. There you go. So there we <laughs> we solved it. We solved it.、Maybe. So also, if you can just go back to that last page of that PDF, there's another section for people to watch. Yes,、uh, number two, which is a very long、uh, section. But what I've done. Is they actually have a debate in which Professor Liao is talking on a panel、uh, with other、um, experts about his ideas, and one noticed one of the panelists on the very far left is rather in his body language very concerned about how Professor Liao is talking, and even makes a、um, very interesting barb. To him, questioning his intelligence,、oh, okay. because he says you've just given 
your idea out to the world mm. and now a startup company will just take that and run with it and you won't get anything yeah and then the woman who hosts it you can see on the screen now mm. she sort of a back arches and she goes right is there going to be something there yeah but i think professor liao he wants these ideas there. He knows the power of ideas. Right. So this is called the World Science Forum. And the leading game um, experts in science regularly go to it every year and just talk and give presentations. But this was like the end of it, like a round table, a Q&A. And the lovely title of it is Life in Our Image, The Ethics of Altering the Human Genome. So that's something to introduce somebody that you've just met on a dating website, maybe for the second date. Save it for the second, yeah, yeah defo. And say that's what you found on YouTube. So there are people there, the things that you can experience and talk. And if you want to find Professor Liao on um, Twitter, send him our love. <laughs> So now to the um, issue of the day, which is Ukraine. And that will be in the next PDF. You've got a really nice reassuring voice, Darren, until until you invited that guy to Liverpool. That's the scariest form of Scouse. Screaming Scouse, which is like, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to stab you, I'm going to do... That's, that's one thing. But when you just say, listen, lad, I just want to have a conversation. <laughs> just come here and we'll have a chat. That was scary. It's on page 10. 10. Yeah. So... What I have titled this section is very originally rather us in a computer game. What if the computer game is in each and every one of us? And what that describes is my counter to a belief that we are in a simulation like a matrix. And what I believe is that even though I love console games and I've had them since the Super Nintendo all the way up to the PS5. I believe that the nature of console games and PC games as well, they have changed how we have viewed the world. And you would know this more than me. If you get a very young person, the, the wiring of their brain is still moving. Yeah. And based upon the environment they're in, the wiring can go to different places. Very so quickly, if they're yeah. in a traumatic place, it will go to areas to maybe defend from trauma or maybe hardwire to trauma or maybe even to get away from the memory centers so they don't replay it again and again as the body self pre 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 preservates itself or preserves itself, I should say. Mm -hmm. So because we live in this area of console games, where you can make an error and then start again or do all types of exciting things, but also quite disturbing things. Has it made reality somewhat now different? Mm. And has it made reality um, more like a computer game? So the computer game is in each and every one of us rather than a simulation. Yeah. So an example of this, because... I um, am quite geekish, I admit it. Um, I took a photo of this from the I newspaper on Monday bank holiday weekend of August 2019. And it practically sums up quite worryingly where we are. So Richard, if you could just blow that up a bit more and then Richard could just read it as it's quite a short article. Children across the UK are preparing to be millionaires as they expect to be paid almost 1.4 million a year when they are adults, according to a survey. A poll of eight to 15 year olds by Halifax found that they expect to earn 1.37 million <laughs> on average when they grow up. In a blow to the confident children, their expectations are nearly 38 times the average wage in 2019. Not content with the prospect of a 1 million pound plus salary, however, they said they would like to earn 3 million a year to have a comfortable life. <laughs> but the UK's, the UK's children appear to be getting more realistic in their financial expectations, having said they would like to earn 3.9 million in the previous year's survey. Children were also particularly optimistic with regards to possible careers, with those surveyed believing that an average police officer would earn £165,000 a year. 
<laughs> while the teacher was perceived to be earning 140000 Ah, oh, wonderful. Those looking to follow in the footsteps of their male and female football heroes would be left feeling shortchanged by £400,000 and 656000 respectively, compared to their expectations. They also optimistically said they would like to retire at the age of 55. Oh, I have some bad news for you, children. <laughs> and that was in that was <coughs> in a world before our unwanted friend from Wuhan arrived. So, uh, but that is a very interesting indication of the notion of reality within us. I, I, I wonder if this is what this, this kind of thing is exactly what accounts for this rising tide of anxiety and depression is just misplaced expectation. People are just so disappointed with their lives and it makes mm. them super anxious and depressed. Like I think uh, based upon what my research is, that I think the trigger point might be the year 2035 mm -hmm. when these children start getting into their 30s and 40s mm. and then they realise that that optimism is gone mm. and they're literally on minimum wage. Yeah. So it could end up being a, a, a delayed time bomb, unfortunately, a suicide mm. in people because people have that. So I always remember... Um, a lyric from Prince, a brilliant song called The Future, mm. and it's on the Batman soundtrack, the Tim Burton one. I like that Batman soundtrack. And he says, who can you trust if you can't trust God? Mm. And what he's trying to say is that the notion of faith gives people hope to survive. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is because of the crimes and pardon the pun, the revelations mm. of what the Catholic Church have done mm. in terms of corruption, being a banker that was found hanging under Blackfriars Bridge in London, mm. if you really want to go there, yeah. and also sexual abuse of children. Yeah. Um, people now have moved in the Anglo-American world or what some people say the Anglo-Saxon world, um, they have moved away from religion. Yeah. So by not having that optimism about another life and being rewarded after this, this is all and now, mm. this is here and now, mm. and you have to get it. And if you don't get it, you're either a loser or a winner. So as you said, this is what will create depression yeah. and anxiety and self-hate. And rage. In people and rage. So the other frightening thing from this year is the international respected news agency Reuters, that's mm. 170 years old, have found out that people under 31 years old, born 1992 onwards, mm. get their information about the world mm. from TikTok. So they no longer even interact with news sources. They get it from TikTok. And also, there is a deliberate avoidance of so-called depressing news, <laughs> like reality. Exactly. I had I just briefly. I know I keep I keep divert I keep diverting us. Last night I was watching Lex Friedman uh, talking with Richard Wolf, and Richard Wolf was presenting. He's an economist. He was presenting his uh, Marxist view of the economy, and he said some things about how capitalists set up businesses that were very strange. That were strange. They were just wrong. So I commented and said, you know, with all due respect to the professor, this is wrong. I've I've set up a business. This is how businesses actually work, not in this way. And a bunch of kids came on and they and, and one of them said to me, and, and it got loads of upvotes, the way that businesses make money is profit is literally the tax that is placed on the workers. And I was like, are you fucking stupid? Where did you get that from? Do you think all businesses are just sat there looking to take their workers and exploit them? And unless those workers aren't exploited, there's no profit. And they were saying, this is what profit is. Profit is the taxation of the workers. I was like, that's not fucking, I'll run an ice cream stand or something. Try, try selling lemonade and employing people and then get back to me. You could even say that wages are a profit of work. So therefore, any advantage of employment is therefore wrong and immoral. So even yeah. wages are wrong. Exactly. So, so exactly. So you, this is the, exactly that. So you follow their line of reasoning. So they take their line of reasoning to there and they go, ah, yeah, see, and then they pat each other on the back. But you've, exactly what you've just said, you've just taken it, 
a few steps further. Yeah. So then, so actually, yeah, you're right. Paying workers is immoral. Yeah. And, but I've got, I've, I've got a solution. This is somebody who's got dyslexia, dyscalculia. Mm. I've been kicked, not kicked out. I wasn't kicked out. So I just left mm. um, university because I just didn't like how it was. A college dropout, they say it in America. Mm. And what it is, I was thinking about this to say, how can we solve this issue? And it's all to do with computer games. It's inspired mm. by computer games. Mm. So in computer games, you have something called credits. Yeah. So what we do is we use the terminology of the console game to sell it to the new generation. Okay. And what we say is there's enough people in the UK that can fill every job on a part-time basis. Yeah. So what we do is we say everybody that can work um, for physical acceptance mentally they can do it mm. you've got to do a minimum a guaranteed of 16 hours a week mm. the rest of it is yours right you can decide what your work patterns are and then the system creates jobs based on your intellectual ability mm. and your life and work experience to mm. what you can do now if you want more credits mm. you can work more hours than 16 right so you can either work more in that role or you can go on a central database and you can see what is what is filled mm. based on your ability yeah. and then you can earn the credits mm -hmm. so that way we have a system in which people can work the roles that they want. Mm. And then if people are more capitalist old school saying they can earn what they want, mm. what we then do is the jobs that are deemed as unattractive we increase the credits for them. Yeah. So instead of saying one credit an hour, we will say that is worth five credits. So if somebody wants to work in a sewer yeah. that is under the Leicester Square area of London and you've got them big fat passages that are due to restaurants, mm. utterly disgusting, like horrific horror show environments, mm. you will pay them people 15 credits an hour yeah, yeah, yeah. for doing the most unpleasant of jobs. Yeah. And then people that have to deal with people with mental health issues and other things that can then give them PTSD, yeah. you give them more because yeah. you value them. Yeah. So a bus driver might end up being gone 10 credits an hour rather than one mm -hmm. because they have to deal with anyone can go on that bus mm. and any conflict can happen with them passengers and they've also got to make sure the passengers are safe mm. due to the behavior of other people driving on the roads mm. so we can have this system where everybody wins so the more marxist people they get their win because you're not forcing people into jobs they don't want to nope. be. And then the jobs that nobody wants to go in but mm. need to be filled, mm. them employees then have to be more attractive. So yeah. rather than have a horrible nondescript warehouse, try to at least paint the walls instead of just having a corrugated iron, mm. try to fit air, air conditioning, mm. try to put some window lights mm. in to bring natural light in, mm. little things that can work. So if I leave in university uh, after repeating the first year, dyslexia, dyscalculia, if I can come with this, yeah. what are the what what are these um Legrand? What's Christine Legrand doing? I don't know. It's a fucking mess out there. It's an absolute mess. I, I do think that kids in schools probably should 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 really learn about money and business and and economics, and they should run experiments, simulations like the one that you just promote uh, yeah. proposed, which is uh, sort of Marxist to the degree that it's from each according to their ability and to each according to their needs. I think Karl Marx would be happy with that. But then, as you rightly say, for the more capitalist inclined who are prepared to grind harder to get more credits or a different form of currency, then then they can have that as well. So, yeah, I think, I think that's fantastic. And the idea. most unifying thing of it is it's the standard of food. I've previously worked in various supermarkets mm. that target various uh, affluents. Yeah. And you can taste the difference in the food. Yeah, 100%. So what we would do is we would say all food would be of a really high standard. And that would be, that would then level it. So if you want to work your 16 hours, you're eating sort of the same level of food as someone more. That That's actually 
very re- uh, it's way more revolutionary than it should be what mm. you're saying but i think as human beings if we can't agree on that we're fucked what for, for what i 100 percent agree with what you just said that's where i start saying i must take over the country and create a benevolent dictatorship under the force of military law for at least 10 years because 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 cheap food cheap food is better than cocaine it's better than meth it's mm. better than gold it's so fucking profitable because you can feed people flavored paste yeah. and fucking entrails, and and they'll they queue like round the corner here at McDonald's. They'll queue round the block yeah. for shite because it's cheap and it's delicious. But yeah. if we said right, that's banned now. Yeah. It must be at this nutrition level. People would be healthier. They'd live longer. They'd block up the hospitals less. What we would but- do is we would say. This is and this is what the NHS does not do. This is what the government do not do. What we should do is look at the reasons why this food is causing a strain on the economy, but also more work to do with the sensory issues of how it works. Mm. So there are people that are addicted to smoking, but then there are some people that are addicted to food. So we need to look into that. But the system, for some dark reason, some sick type reason to use a star wars approach wants this oh yeah and yeah. that's the frightening it's pro- thing it's very profitable that's so the that, that's thing. why you need a benevolent dictatorship because all the gangsters of food and the gang- gangsters of pharmacy would rise up and they must be thrown into a gulag Sorry, so mate. on the next page we have some data because some people might say oh you're just saying anecdotes and youtube videos but I do bring um, data and facts and graphs. I actually bring graphs, Richard. So that is on... I love a graph. Uh, yeah, that's the next page there. Just scroll down there. Yeah, so this is from the Press Gazette. And this is from a few weeks ago from the Reuters Institute um, regarding digital news. They do it every year. And this is um, regarding how people now of a certain age get their news. So it's now gone to social media rather than directly from a website. So it's very um, worrying that people are now sort of self-editing what is depressing and it's more important about them feeling pleasurable. But then when reality bites, then they're not prepared to deal with it. Got no resilience. Exactly. Mm. So that's where we are at the moment. So the other thing, because I look at reality, as I often do, if you just scroll down that page, uh, this is from a few weeks ago from the Washington Post, which is owned by one Mr. Bezos. And this is informing um, the American people that the Ukraine conflict that we're currently seeing is going to be the new Afghanistan. Right. And this is going to go on for years. So if you could just read those two things that I've left there. Uh, the the ones outlined in blue? No, um, the, t- the, the quotes underneath the photo oh, yeah. and then the other paragraph. Uh, we're here to dig in our spurs, Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin said, after convening dozens of nations in Brussels to pledge greater support for Kyiv. Even if that reality does not materialize immediately, officials have described the stakes of ensuring Russia cannot swallow up Ukraine, an outcome officials believe could embolden Putin to invade other neighbors or even strike out at NATO members, as so high that the administration is willing to countenance even a global recession and mounting hunger. So that's where we are, people. So basically the most powerful nation militarily in the world is willing to see their citizens go through financial hardship and even hunger to basically beat Vladimir Putin in Eastern Europe. And yesterday, ironically, as things come into being, our Prime Minister said exactly the same. What's so a surprise? You, so if you could just put this link. So this is Mr. Johnson saying that when you have higher bills um, and higher cost of living, including food, that is the cost worth paying. He is a multimillionaire. It is a cost worth paying to prevent Putin winning. So what I would suggest to anybody that is watching this at any period of time, if you get a bill that you can't pay, 
or you want an item, just say, this is how much I can pay. And the reason why I can't pay the rest is due to us trying to defeat Vladimir Putin mm. and then just walk out of the shop with your <laughs> designer um, sweatshirt or whatever it might be after putting £5.50 on the, on the cash out. And also when you call a call centre, mm. say, yes, my heating bill might have gone up to £800 and £37 for the last quarter for my bed sit studio. Mm. But all I can afford is £15. Why do you think this Ukrainian thing is going on? What's it covering up? What, how, who's the advantage? It's covering up two things. First of all, it's covering up um, artificial intelligence, conscious artificial intelligence. And the next is the rise of China. So... Vladimir Putin said a few years ago that any nation that discovered conscious um, Jarvis Tony Stark style AI would be a threat to the rest of humanity mm. because we would have a two tier system of humanity mm. because the AI would be able to create inventions and advances in decades that would have took maybe centuries and then the ones that didn't have it would be paupers. Mm. So he stated quite worryingly that he would, if it wasn't shared with Russia, he would use thermonuclear weapons. That's reasonable. Yeah. See what you've developed on your own with no help from me. Give it to me or I'll smash your fucking head Gangster, in. Gangster business. <laughs> so the other thing I believe is China and what, China has, they have two choices, mm. the Anglo-American way or the Russian way, which is known as BRICS, which is Brazil, China, India, and South Africa. Mm. And that is a new economic, eventual military bloc that will challenge NATO and the Anglo-Americans. And what the West realize, if they can take out Russia, Mm. then that leaves China with no backup. Right. So it's either you take on all of us yeah. or you accept the terms and conditions. So this is about the next phase, which is about putting China in a geopolitical corner. So it's it's chess. So then would you agree with the people who sort of say, look, NATO kind of goaded Putin. They sort of ignored Putin. They goaded him into making his first move on the chessboard into the east of Ukraine. And now, rather than everybody pushing for peace talks, everybody's pushing to elongate the war. And that's an effort to exhaust Russia mm. so that Russia is no longer backing Ch or is a weak ally of China. What I would say is, I am no Putin apologist or fan. Neither of us are. Is that... He wanted this and the reason for it, and you would directly know why you are a martial artist and Putin is. Mm. And there is something, I've done Shotokan Karate for a number of years in my teenage years. And there is something when you've done martial arts for a period of time where when it comes to the fight, mm. it's on. Yeah. And you will warn someone and you will warn someone. Which he did. And when they cross that line, it's on. Mm. And he said in 2015, I believe, that the Russian military by 2020 mm. would have 95% of everything new. So that is bunk beds, um, cafeterias, uniforms, vehicles, stationery, 95% mm. everything new. Mm. So he looked at the year 2020 as the time he was ready to fight. So he was building up his troops. From 2014, the yeah, original so, invasion yeah. of Ukraine, yeah. to 2020, six yeah. years to prep and come back. Exactly, preparation, like a martial artist. Mm. And then what he it reminds me of is to you've seen this in your occupation being on the door two people you know want to fight mm. and they just wind each other up mm. and instead of just either just punching one 
they just wide each other because what I think it is, again, going back to martial arts philosophy, it's the build-up of chi. Mm. You just can't... So, some people can automatically have access to that rage mm. and go straight there, yeah. but others need the build-up of the chi yeah. or of the adrenaline and then push, 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 push. Bang. Then they're ready, yeah. And yeah. I think what's happened is Putin has wanted the pushback from the West yeah. to go to Lavrov to go to Peskov, to go to Medvedev, to go to Nubila, and all these people in his in his circle to say, look, they're pushing us. Yeah. They're pushing us. Look at what they're doing. Yeah. And he's <laughs> wanted the fight, yeah. but he's got to have them supporting him. Yeah. And then he's also got to sell it to his population. And that's what it's done. Instead of Putin going to Xi Jinping mm. and saying, look, the, we had an agreement with Gorbachev mm. saying that they would not go into Eastern Europe mm. and Ukraine would be neutral. Yeah. Um, you go to Xi Jinping, he then acts as the mediator yeah. between Russia and, um, and America. Yeah. Putin didn't do that. So he, I believe, wanted it. And then also what is worrying for all of us mm. he recently talked to a group of young entrepreneurs and he was talking about a uh, peter the great yeah and the formation of russia mm. and originally st petersburg or leningrad formerly was run by the swedes and he said well st Pete, peter the great pushed them out mm. and created st petersburg named after him mm. which was the first capital of the country and that's how we're here today mm. so he's now looking at himself as a 2.0 peter the great yeah so he's got um he's got ambitions of grandeur oh you're about to say fantasy i think fantasy yeah. is the right way way to say it yeah so he's got these ambitions um, of trying to bring back this neo-Soviet Union. I don't even think it's neo-Soviet Union. I think it's more Peter the Great style. He wants the old Tsarist oh, Russia exactly. back. Exactly. So that's the um, worry of where we are. But both sides, they sort of want this, yeah. but you've got to sell it to the people. Yeah. So he is selling uh, what NATO done in Libya, mm. particularly how the gruesome murder or the yeah, murder of Muhammad Gaddafi mm. not a very nice man but very gruesome and you didn't, get into the didn't details. need to have a bayonet shoved up his ass before he died yeah he? and stuff so he's showing his population that on their version of BBC One you've now got people talking about nuking Stonehenge mm. nuking the United Kingdom in various ways um, so it's getting very, very serious. So he's selling that to his side. Our side now is telling us through Boris Johnson yesterday that if we pay higher bills, it's worth it. Yeah. So they're now selling it in different ways now. So we're selling it like he is the new Hitler mm. and he is selling it like this is for the uh, greater Russia. This is for us to now take our stand and have our century. So you've had the British century with their empire. You've had the American century with their, let's say, militaristic economic empire. Mm. And now he wants an old school empire. Yeah. So, so they're selling it to both sides. But both sides want it. Both sides both, definitely both, want both it. Si both sides want it. I'm not a Putin apologist either. I just don't know why on December the 21st of last year, when Putin demanded in a lengthy letter that NATO offer him the assurance that Ukraine wouldn't join NATO, we didn't just fucking give him that assurance. I think what he's also guilty of, Putin, he should have distinguished between the European Union mm. and NATO. At that time of the letter, there was a distinction. Mm. European Union was showing the world, we're not NATO. Yeah. We're economics, we're business, mm. uh, we're all of these things, but we're not militaristic. Yeah. So what Putin should have said is, Ukraine can join the EU, but no NATO, no yeah. military. Yeah. And because of what he's done, the EU and NATO now are like this. He's unified the West. Yeah. Incredibly, well, not incredibly, but... Ironically, unfortunately for him, he's, he's completely unified the West against him. And that's it. But what he's now done 
is his popularity in the country of India mm. is higher than their leader, Modi. Mm. So Indians now see Putin as a hero against Western advancements. Mm. It's now made India and China, who were trying to vie for the nation that will control India, mm. they're now talking. Yeah. And now you've got this triangle, which I couldn't believe in 2019 mm. of India, Pakistan and China yeah. all now talking diplomatically yeah. and economically. Yeah. So now we're seeing this rise of like Asia yeah. saying it's us against the, the West. Anglo-Americans, yeah. the West. Yeah, yeah. So now it's unified us, but now it's unifying them. Mm. Mm. So it's very strange. So I think what we're going to see in the next couple of years we're going to see South Korea needing to make a choice and we're going to see Japan needing to make a choice yeah. on what side there is. But the joker, because in any game of cards, there's always a joker. Mm. The joker's France. Right. And basically, France has lost the most of any country off this conflict because Russians, wealthy Russians, love to vacate, va have vacations in France. Mm. As we spoke in the last conversation about how Russians of an intellectual level will start talking in French. Yeah. There's a historic bridge between them two countries. Yeah. And also Russians love designer French goods. Mm. And they have lost billions off this conflict. Yeah. So what could happen? The joker in the pack could be France. Right. And France could say, we're going to think of our own interests and we're now going to build a bridge with Russia. So you could now see, I any if you would have told me in 2019, in August when I took that screen grab, mm. that in six, seven months, everything would be shut down because of a mysterious virus. I wouldn't have believed you. As yeah. I wouldn't have believed capitalism would have done such a thing, right. but it did. Yeah. So anything can anything can happen. Yeah. And what could happen is the European countries could end up turning on France. Right. France is a nuclear power. Right. So they're the joker in the pack. So expect to see a possible about turn from France because mm. I forgot... Out, anywhere outside of Russia, the most property owned by Russian oligarchs is in France. Is it really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Chateaus and all, all ah, of that okay. stuff. Skiing, chateaus, the south of France. The, the property Paris. that has the greatest value yeah. is, in, is in France. So I would, I would have guessed really Spain. Lost. But yeah. They've really lost. So if you go now to the next page, please. I got the opportunity to work in Kiev, teaching people how to overcome trauma. Do you think I should go? Not just yet. Not just yet. Um, it's needed, but not just yet. They started like, shelling Kiev yesterday. Did you hear that, Ben? They actually started shelling them again. Say yeah. Say you were going to say to me, don't, don't go. go. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a wonderful summary of what we've talked about um, from that Washington Post article. And if you could just read um, the text from um, Aaron and then underneath Michael as well, please. Okay. Uh, this is Aaron, is his name Mate or Marte? Marte, yeah. Uh, uh, Washington Post casually acknowledges that we are ruled by sociopaths. Biden admin is willing to countenance even a global recession and mounting hunger to deny Russia a victory in Ukraine. Will anyone ask those who will endure this, count this countenance recession and hunger what they think? Michael Tracy uh, tweets, are you willing to accept a global recession to ensure the Zelensky government's control of... S oh, God damn. Seven, seven Diosk. Severodonetsk. Severodonetsk. If not, too bad. That trade-off's already been decided. Yep. Should, should I read the, uh, the... No, we've already read that. Oh, okay, okay. But yeah, so that's the reality, people, of where we are. Mm. And the, the, the title of my notes... You will be poor to feed our war and like it, you fucking slaves. And you will put that on your Facebook, like a little icon on your Facebook, mm. whilst you're eating beans on toast for the 17th consecutive day. Yeah, you have to keep turning the heating off because yeah. you just can't fucking afford it. And Dr. Liao would like it because we're eating less meat. Oh, yeah, and we'll, our children will shrink in size because they're undernourished. There Dude, it's all part of a plan, I'm telling you. It's a global conspiracy. So, yeah, so um, 
so that's it people that's that's where we are so now if you scroll down that page um, this is the most amazing thing. This is from Monday the 20th of June. But oh, shit. The, <laughs> I don't like that title. <laughs> there you go. So what I've called these notes, when I made them, people, the PDF, I've called them, it's nearly all available. Mm. And the reason why I titled it that is because the information from the mainstream media, declassified sources of government and military, and tweets and YouTube videos. If you link them all together, you are near enough now revealing what is happening. Maybe a decade ago to maybe 15 years ago, people like Julian Assange were needed. But now it seems that people in very senior occupations that normally would keep things on a quiet or a down low, they're very open now about opening up and telling people their intentions. And I think that can be regarded to the impact of social media, where everybody in the world wants attention and everybody wants to be viral and everybody wants to be known. So even people like this general, yeah, Richard is going to read yes again in his lovely voice we and go. to see his reaction of horror um, <laughs> what, that I actually like in a very uh, twisted manner. Um, is he even talking about? The new chief of the British Army has braced troops for swift mobilisation to Eastern Europe and said it is vital they and their allies are capable of beating Russia in battle. General Sir Patrick Sanders issued a battle cry to all ranks as well as civil servants, in the form of a memo saying that the conflict in Ukraine reinforced the army's core purpose of being ready to fight and win wars on land. Senior military figures said the intervention last Thursday during his first week in the job served as a reminder to, gov to the government to invest in land capability. Last year, Boris Johnson said that the old concept of fighting big tank battles on European landmass is over. I, I used to want to join the army and they started saying that in 2001 and it has not been true at any time. Sanders noted in his memo seen by the Times that he was the first chief of the general staff since 1941 to take command of the army in the shadow of a land war in Europe involving a major continental power. He pointed towards a future escalation of the conflict saying that there was a burning imperative to forge an army capable of fighting alongside our allies and defeating Russia in battle. Harumph, 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 harumph. So what I get from that... Is, see, the, 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 the universe is worried. That's the Russians, mate. You see, Pu oh God, we're it's that Putin. We're going to get fucking Novi chocked now. The, I don't feel very well, Ben. Blah. See, this is the universe in action and process, people. This is what, th that is just a perfect summary of what, how I felt internally when I read that on the I mean, it's, it's, ch it's chilling, isn't it? Because there is now, what is he? Chief of the British Army, not just the high ranking official in the army, but a, the chief of the British Army saying, we must prepare for boots on the ground, not tank warfare, infantry warfare. So what I get from that, there has been... Um, like when you prepare for a major title fight, mm. you have two promoters mm. and they will agree on the venue, the time and um, the weight, who gets the first entrance, what music will be used, who will be the broadcasters for the major fight and um, who will be the referee mm. actually in the ring and who will be the judges. Mm. So what... I interpret via we're living in a world of weapons of mass destruction, mm. like Novichok, as you mentioned, mm. and also thermonuclear weapons. Mm. For the general to talk about a major infantry war, that seems to be going back into time, yep. unless the two sides have got together and have wrote the rules of conduct for the fight to say that we will have a conflict yeah. but no weapons of mass destruction will be used. I think I think you can you don't have to do it overtly it can be implied. Nobody wants nuclear war and uh you know that you would have seen it. Most people I asked about this didn't see it but I guarantee you would have seen it. 
the Russian official who said that they would set off nuclear bombs that created a radioactive a tsunami, wave yeah. that would cover England and yeah, Ireland. Rosaya uh, one that was on the vi- Russian version of BBC yeah. One. Yeah, sorry, United Kingdom and Ireland, um, but the whole of the British Isles. Um, and I told my mum, because she hadn't seen it, because she's watching mainstream news, and she got really panicked and she kept asking me about it. And I said, don't, don't, I, I wouldn't have told you if I'd known you'd be this upset. Mm. Don't worry about it. Because yeah. it's a standoff. It's been a standoff for years. Mm. If they do that, we'll do that to them. What if we're dead? Our allies will do it to them. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just, we don't want that. And and what I would say is, is, even in Syria and and in Iraq and other contested areas, we sort of have all mutually agreed that we can have these cat's paw wars. So I can have my lads fight your lads, not in my street and not in your street, but on the football field over there. Yeah. You can't fight, I can't fight, and we don't go your road and my road, but we could sort out over there. I think it's an escalation of that mm. where you go, we'll do infantry. Yeah, we'll do infantry. Are we going to do chemical attacks? Well, if you do that to us, we'll do that to you. Are we going to do nuclear bombs? If you do that to us, we'll do that to you. But we're not fighting in Russia, mm. but we'll fight it out in Ukraine. And it's still it's still a terrible escalation because yeah. we will cap Brits will capture Russian troops, Russian troops will capture Brits. It's going to be horrendous. It's going but, to be awful. But if we live in a reality where the youth believe that they need over a million pounds <laughs> a, a year <laughs> to survive, how can and they're living in such a fan? fantastic fantasy i think all of their how can they be conscripted to fight <laughs> that as long as their pronouns are honored in basic training mm. <laughs> i think i think they'll be fine <laughs> because come here you slimy little fucking maggot actually it's z smiles slimy little fucking maggot <laughs> because ultimately you can play call of duty or rainbow six but in real life there's no restart rainbow sex lgbtq plus <laughs> there's no there's no like there's no like restart on yeah, that yeah, this yeah. is reality but yeah, they'll be gutted won't they when they're like gets blown off it's like where how do i respawn dlc dlc <laughs> download download now yeah so it's going to be interesting how they are going to somehow because what happened yesterday or two days ago at glastonbury mm. which i was really surprised with michael evis i didn't hear about um, this. there was a video i don't know if there was a live address or a pre-recorded address from Zelensky mm. to the crowd on the pyramid stage oh right so that tells me that they are preparing the youth, the majority of people that go to Glastonbury. I like you? everything Zelensky is doing. He has said training for voice to make more gravelly, always in combat yeah, fatigues, fatigue, yeah. tight t-shirt. He is quite sexy these days. I like very much. He's a, it's weird now. The major players on the on the world stage are younger than me and you. Yeah. Isn't that mad? He's 41. Yeah. <laughs> like you sent, but Darren sent me a voice message the other day. He's like, we're old heads now. I was like, no, we're not. And I went, fuck, we are. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't get conscripted, so we can joke about no, this. No, the conscription age now, uh, Ukraine has set it, is 18 to 60. I'm gay. I've always been gay. And, and also didn't, Anyone LGBT is welcome. Fuck. So that is, I'm mad. I've always been mad. I love drugs, drugsy drugs, drugs, all the time, drugs. Zelensky has uh, allegedly opened um, psychiatric wards. Right, for? To fight the Russians and prisoners. Oh, sorry. I was confused there. I was like, how would that help? He's let uh, psychiatric inmates. Yeah. Into- allegedly. Right. And right. also soldiers that were in prison, people with military experience in Ukrainian prisons were released to fight the Russians. This this reminds me of like old American war movies from World War Two, The Untouchables or uh, uh, The Inglorious Bastard style. Yeah. We need a special military unit. Let's take people on death row with yeah. combat experience. Put them suicide together squad. And, suicide and the, squad. Uh, DC yeah. universe. Yeah. So, so, it, so it could be, oh, well, I suppose if it was a land war and we got desperate, we could get conscripted. Yeah, no, I think I think that's where it's coming because I think yeah. the Glastonbury address from Zelensky yeah. was a preparation to tell that metropolitan liberal crowd yeah. that this is your war. As yeah, well it's as making it it's making being a soldier cooler. Yeah, more hipstery, more. Yeah, so I do think, and also apparently, what uh, Ukraine has done is a uh, Polish police now have legal jurisdiction in Ukraine 
They really? can now uh, arrest people, question people in Ukraine. Polish citizens can now get um, um, work in the certain senior levels of the Ukrainian government. Wow. And um, one of the things that I believe they are doing now is any men that have fled Ukraine who were Ukrainian, yeah. who were of conscript age 18 to 60, mm. are now getting rounded up in... Dumped back. In Poland, in Slovakia, Czech Republic, and Romania, and being sent back. So, if you were already in Czech when the war started, you didn't have to go back, did you? But what were they saying? That some people have fled to Czech after the war. No, started. all Ukrainian men should go should go home. Yeah, should go home and fight. Oh fuck! I so didn't know there's that. a there's a round like a press gang. Yeah, like yeah. What we used the to old have. press gangs. Yeah. yeah, in the British Navy. Why aren't so, you fighting, you damn coward? Yeah, back so the you go. press gang and all the Ukrainian men that have fled and they're taking them back Fucking to the line. Man. So yeah, so this is this is where we are, people. So on the next page of the PDF, in unlucky thirteen, um, the first um. Hey, Polinka, we just click to that, please. Is from an individual known as a Tobias Elwood. Elwood, who is his background, his conservative, um, classic tough, um, served in the military, went to the finest schools, and he is now connecting the current industrial disputes by the Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers Union as actually being almost traitors to the country by using the term Putin's friends. Right. So what we're now seeing is an escalation that any any debate that goes against the mainstream narrative, you are now a traitor. How how did he how does he get away with saying they're Putin's friends? What have they done to deserve that? Uh, what he's just basically said is the senior MP said the disruption caused um, is basically distant, distracting the government from the war. Oh, for God's sake! So the government is incapable of doing two things at once. So that says to me that what um, Tobias, Mister Elwood, is saying is that the government are a bunch of simpletons. Right. So the senior Tory MP said the disruption caused by this week's industrial action. We've got loads of rail strikes going on at the moment, folks. If you don't know about the, the UK, the biggest on Britain's rail network for thirty years. They're literally just switching off the trains for a day at a time. Was in across the whole country was distracting the government from the war in Ukraine, a fact the Russian president would be enjoying. Speaking to Sky News, Mr. Elwood said, we face huge economic headwinds, yet here we are causing such huge self-harm as the country is brought to a halt. I think Russia must be enjoying the self-inflicted distraction. Please, please to see that the one government in Europe that's actually standing up to Putin is completely distracted in this way. Tobias Elwood, you piece of shit. Yeah, so he is, he is a future prime minister. So what I never man. said you were that. He said that. <laughs> I, I, I'm but, um, sorry, Prime Minister, as I've been conscripted. Future Prime Minister, <laughs> yeah. Let's just pull this up off social yeah, you media. You and me are going to the worst place. Like yeah, Corporal Grannon, could you just come into my office, please? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say this on YouTube in 2022? I meant it in jest, sir. <laughs> yeah, so he is definitely a future Prime Minister in the making. So um, he's now saying that anyone that is standing up um, also, we're going to have major strikes within the bus sector, public mm. transport. Mm. Um, a, a business called Stagecoaches of today, their strikers are going on a one-day strike, mm. and then every week thereafter, it will be one day a week. Right. Arriva, which is a rival bus company, their bus drivers apparently are going to go on strike indefinitely until they get it now. My view on this in terms of economics is this. When our unwanted friend from Wuhan arrived, mm. certain individuals were classed as key workers, yeah. but they did not get any benefit from that classification of which the government gave them. Yeah. So what we had, we had people working in supermarkets. Whatever your view of what this could have been, at the time, we didn't know. Mm. It could have been bio-warfare launched by the communist executive of their party mm. to damage the West. It could have been a lab experiment gone wrong. Mm. 
And you had people working in supermarkets on minimum wage that were deemed key workers, therefore they had to work. With no masks, by the way, for a couple of months, exactly. if you believe in masks. Just so some people don't don't seem to forget that. I was walking around supermarkets with kids uh, stacking the shelves, surrounded by people all day, every day. The first few months of lockdown, none of them had masks on, none of them had PPE. Yeah. Kit. So these people... Instead of, I would have, if I would have still been working in retail, mm. I would have started um, some communication with the company. And then I would have gone through my MP and I would have said, uh, it's from Armageddon, a Bruce Willis film, mm. where he goes to the US government and he says, if you want my team to destroy this meteor that will end all life on the planet, mm. we don't pay tax. Ever again. Ever again. And they go, okay, then. And what should have happened was the Armageddon rule, as I call it, mm. should have been given to all those key workers. Mm. If you go into work during the pandemic while the studders are furloughed watching Netflix or still working but working in the pyjamas, you don't get any tax. See, you this, have it tax free. This is the type of socialist I can deal with. This is the type of socialist reform that I think is is perfectly sensible and perfectly reasonable. My, the government is benefiting from their work. Why should they be taxed? So and they, and they give them a classification essential work. They actually wrote the, the occupations that mm. were essential key mm. workers. So therefore, give them yeah, some benefit. a little bump. Come on, lads, give them something back, and just he, to say thank you. And all he did was Boris Johnson. Very, you can see photos of him. Someone's done a, a brilliant compilation on YouTube. The man just hasn't even got any enthusiasm to clap. Yeah. He's just like... Yes, yes, peasants. Yeah, do your fucking yeah, job. Yeah, Let me, like, go back and um, do whatever he, he was Snort doing. Snort gold dust cocaine. Yeah, most Dead babies' brains or whatever tops they <laughs> So now, a few days later, and this is where it gets really dicey. We've, we've only got four minutes left, would you believe? Of course. <laughs> Time is not our friend, does No. So the last bit, if you just want to go to that link on page 13 and just click on the hyperlink, I'll explain it really quick. Yeah. It, there's a festival that is um, with, like the Glastonbury of British intelligentsia. Oh, yeah. And it deals with British history, ancient, contemporary and future, possibly. Mm. And one of the speakers was a former senior British Army officer, General Sir Richard Sheriff, in which he basically stated that Western nations have to push for the defeat of Putinism and the defeat of the Putin regime. So he is saying to this intelligentsia that this is necessary. Okay, so, so the, se the secret objective is regime change. Is regime change. So we are basically getting prepared to storm Moscow like Napoleon did and failed. But <laughs> we will apparently, in an age of thermonuclear mm. and weapons of mass destruction, mm. we will achieve what Napoleon failed to do. I I think that's a bad idea. A terrible idea. If, if, we're, if we're pissed off that Russia isn't respecting the sovereignty and the democratic process of, of Ukraine, we can't then infringe on Russia's sovereignty and democratic process in, in, in exchange. Yeah. That, that what I would sense. just tell people is a lot of this is heavy and a lot of this is gloomy, but it is better to be empowered mm. and knowledgeable than, than be unaware because when the conscription papers arrive, mm. it's going to hit people. Would you get through basic training, do you think? Yeah, you would. All the blacks are all the blacks are in the worst place possible. We're dead. <laughs> so you'd get through and just die. No, we wouldn't even do basic training. They wouldn't even spend the money on the blacks. They just <laughs> say, hell does. "Here's a plastic knife and fork. <laughs> Go and fight the Chechens." And then what they'd do is they'd have a um, drone, and Boris Johnson would be laughing going aren't they brave boys <laughs> aren't those jamaicans brave boys and they'd just be loving it in their sadistic mark was the sad fantasy of look at all of them um jam jam jars that's what they call us look at all them jammy jars with our plastic forks doing your trying best trying to fight Chechens, doing your fucking best <laughs> who have got these machetes and 
and and AKs and all of that and Bowie hunting knives. You know, we're finished. The blacks are finished. That's it. But enjoy your day, people, and remember if you if you've never had Singapore fry rice, oh, you better get it now. Yeah, get it now because this is it. This is your <laughs> last <the> time. <laughs> Well, fucking hell. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and your attention. And we will be back in a few weeks with more from Darren Williams. Thank bye you, bye. sir. Bye-bye.